happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. That's how Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. began his remarks to the crowd at the March on Washington 55 years ago. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Today, I'd like to reference a less quoted passage from that speech. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note with every American was to fall out. It is obvious today, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient far. As we're coming off a government shutdown and a dispute about DACA and the fate of the Dreamers, is this statement from Dr. King still relevant in some way for some groups of people? Is racism an issue in East Idaho? Well, that latter question is the focus of this week's Good Question. to start this discussion by talking to our reporter, Natalia Hepworth. She was born in Jamaica and moved with her family to Rexburg when she was eight years old. She also has East Indian ancestry and comes from a multicultural household. Her dad is white from Rexburg and her mom is black and from Jamaica. I started out by asking, have you ever felt judged by the color of your skin? Hepworth recalled an experience she had in middle school. Every day for about a week, a kid on the bus said, go back to Africa. And like to me, I was like, okay, well, first off, I'm not even from Africa, so you have a totally wrong kid. But it, it was something that I told my parents, but my parents have never really taught me to react to things like that. Joanna Morris lives in Rexburg with her husband and six kids. Joanna is white, but her husband, Mark, is black and has African ancestry. Joanna says having children in an interracial marriage comes with challenges. People often assume that my children are adopted because that's the other black kids that are around here. They, they say, in fact, they don't understand. But when I first moved here, I didn't know what they meant. They say stuff like, where'd you get your child from? I, I didn't know what they meant. You know, they moved from Texas. They lived in Texas. Or this particular child was born in Massachusetts. Some of the, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, but then I realized finally that they were, that they were asking me if they were a child with my they, they assumed that my child was not biologically my child. As an adult living in Idaho, Hepworth says she has never felt discriminated based on race or skin color, but says she is keenly aware of how different she is. And that's something that I even still struggle with. Like, like oh, if I wear my hair curly, like people are gonna think that I'm like this like ghetto black person or whatever. Like, are people gonna judge me because my hair looks different, or are they gonna judge me if? You know, if I if I wear certain types of clothes, are they not going to see who I am on the inside? And those are all those are questions that like I ask myself every day. Joanna says her kids have paid more attention to their difference in skin color since they moved here in 2014, but are proud of it. They make jokes about it sometimes with their friends. This community has been super accepting and kind and open-minded. So how do other minority groups feel? Liliana Vega has Mexican ancestry and teaches diversity education at the University of Idaho. She currently lives in Boise, but was born and raised in Blackfoot. Vega says racism is a problem in East Idaho and says she's been treated like a second-class citizen her entire life. I remember very clearly in junior high, our school principal, our school counselor, and the school officer following us all over the school as if we, you know, because you have a group of brown students hanging together, we immediately got 
classified or categorized as being in a game. As an adult, Vega recalls walking into a store with a U of I t-shirt on. When she brought her groceries to the front of the store, the cashier asked if she was the janitor. Uh, in my head, I was like, okay, um, you gotta be kidding me. Vega cited numerous experiences like this from her life and the lives of others, which sometimes involved bullying from white people. Vega says she, too, constantly thinks about the way she dresses because she's often viewed as uneducated. That's where white privilege comes into play. Um, white people don't have to think about those things, and that's why people don't understand what white privilege is about. You don't actually, like, it's automatic to you. You don't have to actively think about those things, um, whereas we have to actively think about, like, okay, how is this going to be perceived? Amando Alvarez is a retired librarian in Blackfoot. He also has Mexican ancestry. He told me being a second-class citizen is something he's gotten used to. He says, for example, that he used to write articles for the Blackfoot Morning News in defense of, quote, his own people. I remember one character here in Blackfoot wrote a, a letter in response, and he said, you know, I'd be happy to, to buy you a one and take it back to Mexico. Alvarez says he's offended when people refer to him as Mexican or Spanish because he's an American citizen born in Idaho. He says ignorance is at the core of racism in East Idaho because many are unwilling to have a meaningful discussion about racism among minority groups. When people talk about racism, they talk about black and white. And um, I, I think that, um, that we Mexicans and Mexican Americans are just taken for granted and, and, and they, don't, they don't take it seriously. Vega, on the other hand, prefers the word Latina. She says people feel threatened by Latinos because they are the largest minority group in Idaho. Systems are built to favor middle class white people. Racism is built on this notion of who has power. And at the end of the day, white people still have power over those Latinos. So just what is the difference between Hispanic and Latino? Alvarez says those who prefer the term Hispanic are claiming a link to Spain. He says the Spaniards invaded Mexico back in the day, so some feel the term Hispanic is a symbol of oppression. Latino, on the other hand, is referring to Latin America. I personally prefer not to use the term Hispanic because it was a term designated to us, um, and it was created, it was created um, as a way to be able to label with brown skin. Both Vega and Alvarez say there is not an all-inclusive term for their group of people. The only way to know what the preferred term is for each person is to ask. Alvarez says he's fine with either one. So how is racial equality achieved? Well, when it comes to changing people's attitudes about race, Alvarez feels that politics is the answer. He says the Mexican Americans need a leader. We don't have a Martin Luther King. Uh, we need somebody that could speak for us. You need that some of these these news shows, these news channels, when they have when they when they talk about DACA, when they talk about the border, and most of the time they don't even have an Hispanic on a panel. Think about it. They don't. <laughs> and, and I think, well, they should have Hispanics, especially Mexican Americans and Mexicans. On the border, I was just telling my wife yesterday, you want to solve the border problem? Why don't you go to Mexico City and, and, and interview some of the people? Why don't you form a panel? Vega also feels getting people from minority groups in positions of leadership is an important step, but says before that can happen, there needs to be a shift in the culture. If a white male speaks out in a, in, a, in a classroom, most people are more willing to listen to that white male than they are to listen to me as a Latina. You know, I as a Latina have to be careful because what I say may be considered me saying race card. Ultimately, however, Natalia feels real change occurs when people realize who they are on the inside. Like I said, it's important to like cherish where you're from and like what I kind of said at the beginning, like my, and my dad has always taught me like if you are yourself first, you know what I mean? Like that's what people are gonna see. For Morris, it boils down to identity and personal choice. As a white woman married to a man of African descent, she's noticed many, quote, black men identify first and foremost as black. In her husband's case, she says it's about knowing first and foremost that he's a child of God. She feels that people of all walks of life come with preconceived notions towards others. We all carry around a little bit of extra baggage with that, but to me I like to think that we still 
at the end of the day, we can divide ourselves from those preconceived notions and treat each other as equal. I'm Red Nelson, EastIdahoNews.com.